Aerodynamics is weird. If you've watched my channel, you've probably heard me talk about how airflow can often be unpredictable and complex. It's one of those areas where your intuition is wrong more than it's right. One area that really shows this well is old cars, like this one, my 1950 Jaguar Mark V. It has big swooping fenders, lots of rounded surfaces, and lines that come together like the back of an airplane wing. It looks aerodynamically efficient, but it is not. A hundred years of aerodynamic testing has given us some pretty useful guidelines. I can just look at this car and say it probably has a lot of drag based on those guidelines. I do know that the drag is bad, not because of those guidelines, but because I've driven it. This car is powered by a motor and a battery out of a Tesla Model 3. If the car had similar aerodynamic drag, it would be getting well over 200 miles of range, but it's not. It's closer to 150. Also, I can look at the power consumed by the motor as I drive. I can use this info to back calculate an estimated drag coefficient, and it's bad. I'm pretty sure I know why it's bad, but if an engineer tells you that something is good or bad without showing you data, they're not a very good engineer. So we're going to do some computer analysis, some physical testing. I'll show you why this car has lots of drag, and we'll find out if it's better backward. It is. It's a lot better. You should be skeptical of rules of thumb around aerodynamics, but those rules can be helpful. One of those rules is that low drag things should have rounded edges in the front and sharp edges in the back. Ideally, you want a pointed end in the back, but this isn't totally necessary. There are things you can do to sort of cheat this. If you look at the back of a modern car, you can see these cheats all over. A sharp edge on the top of the lift gate, little features on the taillights, and protrusions on the pillars. All of these things do the same thing. They force the airflow to detach from the car. What you really don't want is air that cannot make up its mind about whether or not it wants to be attached. The transition between attached and detached is really bad for drag. As the air goes over a car, it stays relatively nice and neat and orderly. If you have a rounded butt on the back of your car, the air gets to a point where it can't stay nice and orderly, and then all hell breaks loose. So before it gets to all hell breaking loose, car designers add these little features that force the air to skip that nasty transitional area. Car butts are bad. Pixar moms, extremely aerodynamically inefficient. If Hank Hill was a car, he would be mad efficient. My Jag is full-on Cardi B back here. It's got a butt up here and a butt down here and even some side butts. This means total chaos aerodynamically. I could probably noticeably increase the aerodynamic efficiency of this car by sticking vortex generators or sharp edges all along the back, but then it would look really dumb, so I'm not going to do that. So, rounded corners out back are bad, but up front, you do want rounded corners. When air is hanging out on the highway and you come barreling through with your car, that air has to get out of the way. Rounded corners up front help to gently direct that air to the side of your car. Sharp edges in the front don't gently direct that air, they just throw it out of the way. The hole you punch through the air ends up being way bigger than your car. Disturbing all of that air requires work. The harder your car has to work, the lower its efficiency will be. The Jag has all sorts of sharp edges up front. This tall radiator grill might as well be a wall. The headlights are slightly curved, but probably not curved enough to keep the air from blasting off to the sides. And the windshield? Oh boy, the windshield. This is all bad. This car came from a time when most glass was flat. The only other car that Jaguar made this year was the legendary XK120, which had far better aerodynamics. In fact, it was the fastest production car in the world at the time. Its windshield is leaned further back and split in two, helping the air to curve around the side. Up front, the radiator grille is not a wall, but a gently curved design. Out back, the car looks less like a butt and has a nicely tapering tail. The top of the fixed head coupe has a bubble up here, which is not ideal, but that's fine because it looks amazing. Compare that to the E-Type, which has a nice taper in the back. It probably still has some detached flow back here, but it's better than the 2 plus 2 E-Type, which looks like an actual clown shoe. Somewhat aerodynamic, but at what cost? The Mark V has all the wrong shapes in the back and all the wrong shapes in the front, but if you turn it around, it has all the right things in all the right places. Or does it? I did tell you that you should be weary of these guidelines. For this to be engineering, we need analysis and physical testing to back up that analysis. I already have the testing, that's what this is. So I threw the car into AirShaper to see how things went. This took some work. I had a scan of the whole car, kind of. It was actually a handful of different scans of parts of the car. I aligned all of these scans to make one shell that was pretty much the whole thing. I did have to shrink wrap the scan to fill out the holes and cavities. This worked okay on one side, but gave me some weirdness on the other side. I went ahead and closed off the bottom and made this a solid. I simplified the model so I could actually modify it on my computer. That gave me some odd looking polygons on the edges here, but that shouldn't affect the analysis too much. Since the car is symmetrical, I can just cut away the side that didn't work out well and mirror the good side. 
Then I can cut away the wheel wells, throw in some actual wheels and tires, and we're good to go. This is missing some important detail. I didn't model all the airflow in the engine bay because there are tons of little things going on and this has a relatively small effect on the overall drag anyway. I also didn't do all of the underside geometry. The center of the car is flat with the battery pack, but the rear has all this complex geometry that I'm not going to try to duplicate. This will give me an analysis result that is a little bit better than the real world, but that's fine. So with the scan all cleaned up and with the wheels that are kind of mostly representative of the ones I have, I uploaded the Model 2 Airshaper and ran the analysis. The drag coefficient is a unitless number that just tells us how much aerodynamic drag a shape has. A good car will have a drag coefficient of about 0.25, most cars are around 0.35, and some SUVs get up to 0.4. The Jag came in at 0.457. As you can see from the chart here, that puts us closer to a bus than a car, though we are still a fair distance away from the Empire State Building, which is nice. This is actually pretty close to what it really is. You can see here the required power shows about 20 kilowatts needed to drive at highway speeds. I can read off the actual power used by the motor while I'm driving from the CAN bus and it does land between 20 and 25 kilowatts on the highway. The simulation is more optimistic than that, but we were expecting that and they usually are anyway. The real world is never as clean and nice as the simulation world. But it's nice to have some real testing to validate the simulation. My land speed car has a drag coefficient of about 0.17, or it will when I get around to finally making a body for it, but it's also way smaller. Total aerodynamic drag is the drag coefficient multiplied by the frontal area of the vehicle. Since the land speed car is way smaller and more slippery, the Jag has the same drag as 15 land speed cars. Okay, so the drag going forward is not good. This is in line with my expectations and my actual real-world experience with range. But for me to really high-five myself with how knowledgeable I am about this kind of thing, I need to verify my prediction that the car is, in fact, more aerodynamically efficient in reverse. So I flipped the car around, spun the wheels the other way, and ran the simulation again. The results came back, and the drag coefficient was 0.339. It is way better in reverse. Let's look at some pictures. The red here is just air that has a lower pressure than the local surrounding air. This is a decent way to visualize what's causing drag. In reverse, the bumper is causing some disruption. It's not surprising. All the wheels are churning up air, which is expected. We're getting a lot coming off the sides of the windshield. This is probably this ledge here. There is a bunch here at the front, and by the front, I mean the rear. This is mostly coming from the sides of the fenders and from underneath the car. Going forward, the car has low pressure zones pretty much everywhere. The fenders, the headlights, the gap between the fenders and the hood are all pretty bad. The wheel wells are kicking air way out, and of course the rear is just a nightmare with all of that air losing its mind back here. The rear wheel spats, however, lovely. Excellent work right here. Adding wheel spats to this car is like getting the extra credit right on a test that you failed. Looking at surface pressure, we can see the reverse car has some high pressure areas in the center of the trunk and up here a bit, but it gets low around the C-pillar and roof here. This is probably good. The air is accelerating around these smooth curves of the car, staying mostly attached. Going forward, there is a huge high pressure area in the front, followed by a thin line of low pressure where the air makes a feeble attempt to cling to the car before just throwing in the towel. Here you can see the flow lines going in reverse is mostly organized and smooth. Going forward is again total chaos. Some of these flow lines go to the windshield and then go the wrong way a couple of feet. This is not good. The noise analysis estimates where wind noise might be coming from. Going forward, it's all just noise up front blasting directly at the driver. Going in reverse, it's nice and quiet up here with some shenanigans going on way out back where nobody cares. So there you have it. I was right. This old British car is more efficient in reverse than it is going the right way. This must be why the British drive on the other side of the road. This is not too surprising considering the shapes on the car, but actually not too surprising considering cars. Sometimes you'll read or hear a criticism of a car that goes something like, it's so bad it's more aerodynamically efficient in reverse. They said this about the 928, the Austin Allegro, some old Fords, but it's actually true for a lot of cars, maybe even most cars. There are two big reasons for this. One is the radiator. The radiator cools your engine by having lots of tiny air passages that blow across lots of tiny coolant passages. This causes a lot of drag. As soon as you start to drive in reverse, your radiator is not radiating anymore. It actually is radiating, it's always radiating, but that's not really how a radiator works. The primary mode of heat transfer is forced convection, which is just all that air getting shoved through. If the radiator is not up front and does not have air being shoved through it, it doesn't do its job. You may get better fuel mileage in reverse, but after a few miles, you may also explode your engine. 
This wall up here exists only because there needs to be a radiator behind it. To get the same heat rejection going in reverse, you'd need to add a large high pressure area to the back. I mean the front, the front when it's going backward. You know what I mean. The other reason cars are more aerodynamically efficient in reverse is crash requirements, specifically frontal crash. You need time to slow down, and at speed, time is distance. This means that there needs to be a specific amount of room in front of you to crumple up before you start to crumple. It's about 700 millimeters as it turns out. You also usually need to see over it, so you end up with this wedge out front that kind of looks like the back of an airfoil. This is also a big part of the reason why most cars generate lift instead of downforce. A lot of older cars that didn't have to meet crash requirements still had this wedge up front because that's a convenient place to put the engine. So the basic shape of a car inherently makes it have less drag going backward, and that whole radiator thing helps too. Modern cars, especially modern electric cars, have lots of effort putting in to make them aerodynamically efficient. Partly all those little tricks we talked about earlier and partly their overall shape. I did a quick and dirty analysis of a Tesla Model Y and found it to be about 10% worse going backward. You might be able to get rid of most of this by just smoothing out this sharp edge on the trunk here. If this was nicely rounded off, the car might be a little bit better in reverse, but it would probably be about the same. But if you get into cars that are very aerodynamic, like my land speed car, you definitely get a lot more drag going backward. I still need to see out the windshield, so you kind of still need a notch up front, but it's so rounded in the front and so sharp in the back that it gets really bad when you turn it around. The Jag has other reasons why it's better backward. We talked about most of them, the square shapes up front, the huge British booty. But another reason is that the rear wheels are covered. This helps a lot going in reverse because the air is still somewhat clean when it gets here. When driving forward, the air gets so churned up by the front wheels and everything else up here that the covered wheel has less of a positive effect. Ideally, you'd cover the front wheels instead of the rears, but we don't do that because steering. We can verify this with another simulation by blocking off the opposite ends and running the car in reverse again. As predicted, the drag gets a little bit worse, but it's still better than the whole car driving forward. You can see the air is cleaned up around the wheels in the back here, but it gets wild in the front with the open wheel arches. This would be a more accurate comparison since you'd need the front wheels to turn. I can make it even more of a fair fight by modeling a wall for the radiator in the back. We'll also add some headlights so we can actually drive at night. So this car could actually be driven around like this, albeit with a tiny windshield. That gives us a drag coefficient of 0.403, which is what you'd expect. Even worse than just swapping the wheel covers, but still better than going forward. So there you go. The Jag has bad aerodynamics. It's draggy. It's loud. All the right shapes in all the wrong places. But it looks good, so I'm going to keep it. And yes, it does get less drag going backward, but your car is probably not much better. So maybe come down off that high horse. AirShaper was nice enough to let me use their simulation for free. I do recommend it if you're trying to find drag or downforce on a car. It's a great tool. If you like this video, consider subscribing, and maybe consider joining the Patreon so I can transfer some of these goofy ideas into the real world. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.